Uh, first of all, we have roll call by yeah. Vice President. Kittleson? Excuse. Yeah. Here. Montbiar? Here. Okay. Right here. Sir? Here. Vanderwilly? Excused. Who? Um, I think he's excused too, yes. He's yeah. Quorum. Here. Okay. Quorum is present. Uh, we'll have Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, can we have a motion on the minutes from uh, last week? They're just very, very fresh. So, okay. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of February 25th. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, F minutes are approved. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Uh, it seems as if we are gathering here more and more often with Committee of the Whole. I just came from Sue Richards' office, and she has a whole stack of stuff that's in the Committee of the Whole file, uh, which I will look at and take a, you know, look at and see what we need to address. I'm hoping that some of these things can be filed, because some of them are quite old, and I haven't heard any discussion about them. So th this may be one of our last meetings, I hope. Um, tonight we have a distinguished guest from the county. Um, committee, uh, Sheboygan County Administrator Adam Payne is here, and he's going to present his um, viewpoint or his points on the uh, proposed 0.5% sales tax. Adam has been working with the Sheboygan County as administrator since January 1999. And he manages, um, administers 22 county departments with nearly 1,000 employees. Um, he is, has a Bachelor of Arts and a Master's degree from UW of Madison. And we also want to extend our, our condolences to uh, Mr. Payne because he lost his grandmother this past weekend and buried her today. And so you have our, our sympathies, and I'm sure this must be a, a sad day for you and your family. So we appreciate you coming. and. Uh, Everything's ready, I guess, with the slide presentation or the, the PowerPoint presentation. So, Adam, would you like to come up, please? Thank Welcome you. to the chambers. Thank you, Madam President, members of the Common Council. I appreciate this opportunity. You might and want to adjust the mic just so yeah, it picks you up there. There we go. That's great. Thank you. I was hoping we'd have more members of the, of the public here this evening because I, I know they certainly follow city issues very carefully, and, and I thought we might have more people here. We have a... a, a future county board supervisor in the back of the room, so it's nice to see him here. And I appreciate that this is televised, so obviously yes. one of the objectives here is to help raise awareness in the community about the challenges that Sheboygan County government faces. So again, thank you for this opportunity. We have a tremendous uh, TV audience, I just want you to know. <laughs> As does the county board. Right. <laughs> well, thank you. I have, as you can see, a PowerPoint. Um, presentation to go through and my assistant Kayla Renz is in the front and Kay is just fantastic so if I don't have the answers I'm sure Kay will uh, she's done a real nice job helping me make these presentations throughout the Sheboygan County or we're actually we're gonna do about 12 I think we have three three more two more after today 12 public forums were essentially sharing the challenges Sheboygan County that all of us face and let's just go to the next slide please I want to talk a little bit about fiscal responsibility, property tax relief, maintaining quality programs and services, and economic development. Those are really the four key uh, prongs of the, of the stool or chair that I want to discuss. And I also want to say, just on the onset, that if anybody in this room or anyone on our viewing audience thinks that I'm enjoying or relishing the opportunity to encourage the county board or recommending to the county board to implement a half percent sales tax, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, the last few months have been one of the, the more challenging and, and, and certainly not so fun experiences of my 11 year career here with Sheboygan County. We've been, we've been working so hard as a county organization to streamline and, and, and avoid needing to implement a half percent sales tax. So I, I just want to be clear on that. I don't want, nor does I think anyone in this community want a half percent sales tax or any tax increased. 
But if we're going to be fiscally responsible, if we're going to maintain quality programs and services, if we're going to lead by example, uh, we're going to have to pay the bills. And so that's why we're at a point where we need to consider it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where we've been, what's the track record of Sheboygan County, why are we in this situation, and just how does the sales tax work, what's at stake. Next slide, please. Here's a high-end report card, if you will, that we often share with the county board. And you'll note back in 1998, where's the little, here we go, 1998, 1999, if you look at this line here, the county board passed two consecutive year increases in the, in the property tax levy of 15%. 15% increases in 1998, 1999. And when I interviewed with the executive committee uh, prior to well, I started in January of 1999, and, and the budget had already been adopted. One of the things they asked was, how are we going to get a handle on this? We can't continue to pass on these kinds of increases. And frankly, I was amazed to see those kind of increases in property taxes. I'm not going to defend it. I wasn't there at the time, but obviously the county board passed two consecutive increases. Being as green as green could be as a county administrator or administrative coordinator at the time, I didn't necessarily have the answer on how we were going to stop that from happening but what we've done is really worked as a team as a collaborative team where the county board adopts a goal they they establish a goal for what kind of increase they want and then all the departments receive a specific target and then i work with all those departments to make sure those department heads produce a budget that hits that target positioning the county board for success and early on what we did is we focused on the rate and you'll see in 2000 right away, we, our goal that year was to maintain the rate, not increase it. In 2001, our goal was the same. And it went to the final um, meeting of the county board in November of 2001, and, and they uh, ended up increasing it for health and human service programs, their prerogative. I was a little disappointed, frankly, but that's what they did. After that, we started reducing it, and we got to... 2003, 2004, and we said to ourselves, or the county board said, you know what, we shouldn't be focusing on the tax rate. What we should be focusing on is the levy, because those are the dollars that everyone's relying on. So starting in 2004, that's exactly what we did. And you can see each year, we continue to reduce the property tax levy and ultimately deliver three consecutive years of property tax relief. Now, Elected officials at all levels like to talk about holding the line on taxes at any level. And those of us in this room or on the county board may talk about reducing or holding the line on property taxes. The county board has done it. And in fact, Sheboygan County is the only county of all 72 in the state that have delivered three consecutive years of property tax relief. I'm proud of that track record. That's a track record I'd like to see us continue because we certainly hear how high property taxes are in this state, and the state legislature likes to point the finger at local government about property taxes, and constituents certainly don't like to pay their property taxes. It's one of the most despised forms of tax pay, taxpayer uh, financing there is. So I'd like to keep that track record going. So big picture, we've made progress. Nine straight years of reducing our property tax rate, three straight years of reducing our property tax levy, and the other thing I wanted to point out is in 2010, our wage and benefit costs are less today than they were in 2002. That didn't just magically happen. That happened due to a lot of hard work that certainly you're doing at the city level and the county board has done at the county level. Tough decisions when you reduce staffing levels, but we've done it, and a big chunk of that was privatizing Sunny Ridge. But our staffing costs are less today than they were in 2002. Next slide, please. What have we done? What are some of the things we've done? One of the parts of this process that hasn't been very pleasurable the last couple of few months is you get people that come out of the woodwork and suggest, well, you haven't been doing anything. Obviously, you need to start cutting or consolidating or streamlining. What have you been doing? Well, you never get that at the city? No, well, 
And so what have we done? The county board has done a number of things. We've consolidated or streamlined, actually consolidated, register and probate with the clerk of courts, comprehensive healthcare center with Rocky Knoll, payroll with information systems, printing with information systems. We privatized Sunny Ridge. We consolidated UW Sheboygan with UW, UW Extension with UW Sheboygan, property listing with the treasurer. Land and water was co-located with planning and our aging and disability resource center that was in a leased facility here in the city of Sheboygan is now in a owned county-owned building in Sheboygan Falls. And in many of these instances, we heard some profound negative feedback. As you know in this room, back in the early 2001, 2002, people did not want to see comprehensive closed. That's, that was a main facility in this community for decades. And my great-grandmother, in fact, uh, died at Comprehensive Healthcare Center, a lot of roots there. And that was very emotionally charged issue. Ultimately, the county board closed the facility, added an addition to Rocky Knoll. They have a better facility, more cost effective. Privatizing Sunny Ridge, my grandmother Toggy, who just passed away, was not real pleased when the county made the decision to privatize Sunny Ridge, and, let, and she let me know it. A tough, tough decision by the county board, but ultimately led to significant taxpayer savings and the sky did not fall. It continues to be run as a nursing home. Next slide, please. Staff changings. I mentioned that earlier, less today than back in 2002. We had 1,349 1, employees in 03. We've reduced that a little over 28%. And you can see the initial cost savings associated with that. We've also done a lot of things with you. There's been a great emphasis on sharing resources, as you know, and I appreciate the leadership of many of you in this room who have been striving for that. One is our shared purchasing agent. We now, as you know, are sharing Bernie Romer, our purchasing agent, and that saved money for both us and you because you didn't have to fill, fully fill a position and we are now splitting those costs. So that's been, I think, very beneficial and continues, I hope, to bring up new thoughts on other things that we can do. Next slide, please. We established an in-house clinic in Sheboygan County. We're one of the few counties in the state, if not the nation, that has their own in-health clinic. We have a nurse practitioner that serves our employees and that saves both the employees' money and taxpayers' money. And we certainly, as you know, invite the city of Sheboygan to join us in that effort, the school district. I think it's something that we need to be striving for. So far, so good. County wellness program, we've got that going, as many people do. I know the city of Sheboygan does, and certainly it all helps. We've made considerable health insurance plan design changes. I know you've done the same here. That's an ongoing discussion. Next slide, please. We completed two rounds of a program evaluation and prioritization process. Quite a mouthful, but I'll tell you, I take a lot of pride in the fact that the board took the time to do this. We looked at every single program and service that Sheboygan County provides, every single one. When I started in 1999, I didn't know we had 207 programs and services. I didn't know how many were mandatory, how many were discretionary. The county board in 2005, the, the chairs of all 10 standing committees met for over a six month period and looked at every single program and service we have, reviewed them, ranked them, prioritized them. Tremendous accomplishment. Again, a lot of people at a lot of levels of government talk about establishing priorities, but if you take the time to really do the homework so they have, a, they have that opportunity to make it happen. We've also done a number of operational studies. We've had outside consultants come in and look at departments like healthcare centers, health and human services, the sheriff's department, highway and child support. Why? Because sometimes when you're part of an institution, uh, if you're the department head for years and years, uh, Lord knows they're very knowledgeable, experienced, but maybe they're not looking at things a little, you know, quite as creatively, or maybe, you know, we've always done it that way. So we've brought in some outside fo uh, folks to give us some suggestions. And in all cases, it led to administrative efficiencies, ideas for improvement. We then went through another round of our program evaluation and prioritization process. We did it again in 2009, focusing on the discretionary programs. Again, if anybody wants some late night reading, it's all on our website, so if anyone in the community wants to look at this and learn more about it or is ever thinking of running for county board, great opportunity to learn about the programs and services we provide. Is it a magic bullet? Is it suddenly going to help us reduce property taxes? No, but it is a tool the county board can use, the tool that any unit of government can use, in my opinion, to help them make tough decisions about allocating resources. Next slide, please. Yes. Are you 
As part of our budget process and the budget instructions we provide every year, we always ask the department heads and the liaison committees to refer to the priority ranking. Now, some utilize it more than others, certainly. But I think as resources are growing tighter and as we start talking about things like a half percent sales tax, I don't think it's been used to the extent it should. And if they don't implement a half percent sales tax, we're not going to be starting from scratch. They're going to have a resource they can go to. It's their priorities. It's not mine, not their staff. It's the county boards. All right, then tell me what you want to cut or reduce. You've got a wonderful place to start. The county board last year implemented a hiring freeze, although I consider it, and it is, a soft hiring freeze because if it's a dispatch officer or a deputy or a, a nurse at Rocky Knoll, a position that has to be filled, it's filled. But we are reviewing all our positions and holding uh, positions open that don't necessarily have to be filled. We had targeted expenditure reductions for every department. I think you did the same thing here. And that was very helpful for us. It was just a 1% reduction for every department last year. And most of them hit the mark. Some didn't. Some didn't. And we're always, at, as you are, soliciting employee and citizen suggestions. And I comment about that, and, and it always makes me grin, because we all know in this room that far more often than not, we hear from people who want more services or better services or have concerns and want it improved but we rarely hear from citizens on specific suggestions on what programs to cut, reduce, eliminate. It would be nice to hear more of that, but uh, we don't. Next slide, please. The county board in 2003 implemented a self-imposed bonding limitation. They were borrowing prior to that about $6.2 million a year. Every year, borrowing, 6.2. Uh, now they in 2003, they said, we're not going to borrow any more than $4 million a year or $8 million over two years. They didn't have to do that, self-imposed, and it's worked beautifully. Since then, we have not borrowed, bonded, more than four a year or eight over two years, and that has saved taxpayers over $5.5 million in interest alone, just because they put a self-imposed limitation and we utilize a five-year capital plan. So we're planning ahead and thinking about what can we do, uh, what works, what fits. Next slide, please. So there's a little snapshot of where we've been. And I know you could give a similar snapshot here for the city. You've done a lot to streamline, consolidate. It's something we need to always be doing. It doesn't just happen now or need to happen in the future. It's an ongoing challenge to streamline, to eliminate lesser priority programs, to help fund higher priority programs. So why are we talking about a half percent sales tax? It's predominantly because that the state mandates programs but does not provide sufficient revenue to implement them. This is what's happening. The state creates the program, and 72 counties are required to implement their state mandates. So counties are the right arm of state government. So the state creates the program, and many of them, if not all of them, are good programs. But they don't have the courage to fund them. On the other hand, They've got all these programs they've created, but we all know in this room not every program is created equal. Some are more important than others, have higher value than others, perform better than others. But the state does not have the courage to eliminate lesser priority programs to help pay for, fund higher priority programs. So they don't have the courage to fund what they create. They don't have the courage to eliminate lesser priority programs, to fund higher priority programs, what do they do? They dump it on county government. They pass the buck. And they say, you figure it out. And so for years, that's what's been going on. In fact, today, all of us in this room and all of your constituents and everyone in Sheboygan County that's paying property taxes, 75% of our property taxes are subsidizing, funding state mandates. 75%. I don't know about you, but this gets my blood going a little bit. People wonder why we're in the spot we are. What about the state's track record? It'd be nice if focused, people focused in on that a little bit more, wouldn't it? The state since 1995 has had a structural deficit. I've been here now almost 11 years, and every single biennial budget, what do we hear from from the state? 
billion dollar deficits. Every single biennium, bu biennial budget, billion dollar deficit. Since 1995, they'd ha they've had a structural deficit. Wow, is that a track record to be proud of? Here's another one for you. Did you know that the state per capita in debt is number one? We lead the nation. Per capita, our debt in the state of Wisconsin is worse than any other state. Isn't that something to be proud of? There's a track record that folks must like to share with their constituents. We don't hear enough about that, though, do we? We hear the state suggest property taxes are too high and that we need caps in place because property taxes are too high. But I think it's long overdue that the state get its own house in order. And I resent them pointing the finger at us and passing the buck to us when they aren't taking care of their own. Well, to add insult to injury, we do get some funding from the state. We get something. And there's something that people may be well aware of called state-shared revenue. You hear about state-shared revenue in the, in the news occasionally and on the radio. Well, what's state-shared revenue? Well, state-shared revenue is something the, the state provides counties, local units of government, to help fund their mandates. It's been going down since the mid-1990s, and I'll show you a slide on that in a moment. The other thing that the, uh, that the state does is we do collect some revenue, not just property taxes, but we collect some revenue such as in our clerk of court's office, fines and forfeitures. Hopefully most of you in this room haven't had to have any interactions with our clerk of court's office. But they do collect fines and forfeitures. The state tells us how much we can collect and how much we have to pass on to them. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here's what's happening with state shared revenue. Since 1996, it's gone down 40%. As far as I know, wages haven't gone down 40%. Benefits haven't gone down 40%. Fuel hasn't gone down 40%. I don't know if there's anything that's gone down 40%. But their state support, financial assistance has gone down. Next slide, please. Clerk of courts, revenue. 75% of your property taxes are subsidizing state mandates. Well, let's just focus in on one department that you and I wouldn't have to spend a nickel on in property taxes if the state was just fair, was just reasonable. Look at the distribution of misdemeanor fine revenue. The county share back in 1987 was $30. The county share in 2009 is $30. The state share, well, in 1987, I used the same number, was 149, and now they're at 206. They don't seem to have any problem tapping into more and more of the revenue we're collecting. Next slide, please. Well, what about traffic citation revenue? Maybe that's a little better. Maybe they're a little more generous there. Well, let's look at 1987. We were at $40 there. We actually had an increase from 30 to 40, from 1983 to 1987. But then we get to 2009. We went from 42.50 in 1988 to 42.50 in 2009. Look at the state share. They don't have any problem tapping into it. Next slide, please. This is the one that really I think is almost either have to laugh or cry, and I'd rather laugh. Ordinance revenue. This is what the county board passes. Their own ordinances. State used to get three dollars in 1977, and we got 53.50. Today. We get 6750 and the state gets 133 bucks. Look at the percentage increases over that time period. This is what happens in the state's biennial budget. This isn't sexy enough to get anybody's attention. Who cares about the clerk of court's office and collecting fines and forfeitures? Who's going to get excited about that? What legislator is going to give you more than two minutes of attention before their eyes begin to glaze over? Yet look what's happening. And now you and I are all spending over $700,000 a year in Sheboygan County to subsidize mandated programs and services in a situation where we could be paying for that department as we go. Next slide, please. So I hope that gives you a little sense of where we've been, some of the things we've done, what's happening to us, the situation we have with state mandates, why now we're talking about diversifying a revenue stream. 
what is it about this set half percent sales tax? How, how, how does it work? Well, the state established the half percent sales tax as an additional revenue source back in 1986. So this has been around for a while. We didn't just come up with this idea. Next slide, please. And most of the states, as I'm sure you're well aware in this room, most of the states, most of the counties have implemented it, 63 of the 72 since 1986. One by one, they've done so. I think some may have come right out of the gate and implemented it as soon as the state authorized it. Others have held off. And others, particularly our part of the state, have really made a concerted effort, I think, to hold off. And I know there's board members that take pride in that. And frankly, it's an ace up our sleeve. Got that half percent sales tax, you haven't used it yet. That's, a, you know, that's an ace up the sleeve. Here, who's, here, these are the folks to give you a snapshot of who have it. And then there's a couple that have implemented uh, uh, stadium tax or something like that. So Washington, Ozaki, and Milwaukee have the half percent sales tax plus an additional 0.1 to support the Milwaukee County Stadium. Brown County has a half percent sales tax, but theirs is fully to support the Green Bay Packers Stadium. But all the blue are the, all the counties that have adopted and implemented a half percent sales tax. Next slide, please. How does it work? Well, food products, medication, medical equipment, fuel, and electricity, that's exempt. It's just like the 5%. It's tacked on to the, the state's 5%. What's exempt from the 5% is exempt from the additional half. I wish it was just a state 5.5% since all the money is essentially going to support their mandates. But it's, it's treated just like the state's 5. And what are impact examples? I don't want to downplay, and, and I've you know, heard some criticism for this. Well, it all adds up, and I know it adds up. And I know any time we're talking about a tax, it should be very thoughtfully discussed and, and can be a burden for people. But generally speaking, and surveys have showed that the sales tax does not rile as many people up as the property tax. And I think it's because they can control more their buying decisions. They don't have to buy certain things. And depending on their level of income, they may buy more or less. So if we're renting a video, Instead of two bucks, it'd be two bucks and a penny. Fish fry from 10 to 10.05. What about a big screen TV? A lot of folks are buying big screen TVs now. An $800 big screen TV would cost you 804. Now I've heard some people suggest, if this half percent sales tax gets implemented, I'm not buying in Sheboygan County. Really? So if you buy a big screen TV, you're gonna drive and there aren't too many counties you can drive to, but you can drive to another county to save four bucks. As a practical matter, it's not worth your time, it's not worth the fuel. A new car, will that change buying decisions? $25,000 vehicle would increase 125 bucks. Yes, sir. Oh, on the, on the car, yeah. It's yeah. So buy a TV, car, go to Manitowoc, it's not going to make any difference. Okay. They have to collect it. If the, uh, if the address, well, particularly on a car, because the, of the title. If it's, if it's right. a, you know, theoretically the best buy in Manitowoc should collect for the TV, but the car dealer for sure, because if it's titled in the address on the title of Sheboygan, the car dealer is going to have to collect it. Right, and I know the cars have, if you go buy a car somewhere else that, and you don't have the sales tax in your county, then they don't apply that, but now you're saying they will. Uh, my understanding is that the state, uh, in their, the state legislature closed that loophole, if you want to call it a loophole. Okay. So that, that is not going to be an advantage now to go buy a car in Manitowoc okay. if, this, okay. if this goes through. And again, my point is, though $125 is not small potatoes, right. my sense is that's probably not going to change a buying decision on a $25,000 item. Next slide, please. So I mentioned already, county, uh, say half percent sales tax goes to the states, 5% piggybacked on. How, do, how does it get implemented? The county board passes an ordinance, need to give notice to the Department of Revenue, 120 days. It's, it goes quarterly in the year. And right now, the uh, University of Wisconsin Extension estimates that we'd raise about $9 million 
if we implemented a sales tax. And what I find attractive with this, and I know there's difference, differences of opinion, but tourists that come here, the estimate is we'd, we'd um, recoup about 1.8 million, about 20%. And they're spending that in those 63 other counties. Those communities are getting the benefit of that income to maintain their roads and help with law enforcement and things of that nature. Why shouldn't we do the same here? I mean, every time we have a big event at Whistling Straits or Road America, we generally have more law enforcement there. And tourists are certainly using our, our roads and our infrastructure. Why shouldn't they help contribute to pay for it? Another question would be, who would you rather have pay for it? You, your constituents, your grandmother, who doesn't have the income anymore and is struggling just to pay property taxes, or tourists? I think that's an opportunity to tap into some revenue and provide some property tax relief. And tourism, and I think most people recognize this, recognize this now, but when we first raised this, well, how much tourism is going on here? A tremendous amount of tourism is going on in Sheboygan County, thanks to good work that the city is doing and all of us, frankly. I mean, it's the private sector with Whistling Straits and Kohler and Road America, and we are now the second fastest uh, tourism Second fastest growing in tourism in the, in the state, right behind Sauk County. We're ninth in the state we're out of the 72 counties, but we're the second fastest. Pretty impressive. Next slide, please. I touched on this. Next slide, please. What about tourists going elsewhere? We talked about going to another county. Will they go to another state? Will they not come to Wisconsin? Well, the maximum sales tax for Wisconsin is 5.6. So I've read a couple of letters to the editor. Well, what's, what's to prevent the county board from raising it another half percent and going to 6% or 6.5%? The county board can't. It doesn't have the statutory authority to do that. Statutorily, we can only raise it a half percent. And how does that compare to other states? Well, Michigan's at 6, Iowa's at 7, Minnesota's at 7.9, and Illinois's at 10.3. Wisconsin's maximum, as I said, is 5.6. People are not going to be leaving the state of Wisconsin because of a sales tax. And again, this goes back to the point I made earlier about input and what we hear from people. Nobody likes taxes. Nobody enjoys discussing the possibility of diversifying their revenue, raising a tax. But people sure like their services. And I personally think we've got some pretty nice services in Sheboygan County. I think people appreciate the work that the Health and Human Services, that the Health and Human Services Department does. I think people in this community want to take care of the mentally ill and the developmentally disabled, want to have law enforcement that's effective and responsive. People have come to expect their roads to be cleared pretty quickly after a big snowfall. It takes money to support that. Next slide, please. I, uh, what does it mean for the average person? And this is very simplistic. Of course, it'll vary greatly depending on your income and your buying decisions. But if you just do the simple math, if, if we raise about 8.9 million, subtract the 20%, that leaves 7.1 million, divide that by how many constituents we have throughout Sheboygan County, that means the average person per capita would be paying $62 and a half percent sales tax. And depending on your perspective, I've heard some people say to me, well, that's one night out. I've heard others say, that'll really hurt me. That's significant. Versus the property tax, if we were going to raise $8.9 million of additional revenue for the property tax, this is what it would mean if you had a $150,000 home. We'd raise your property taxes, the county board would, 150 bucks. 250 on a $250,000 home, about $400 on a $400,000 home for a one-for-one one apples to apples comparison. Next slide, please. So fiscal outlook. One is deductible and one isn't. One is deductible and one isn't, although that's changed, as you know, Jim. Some years you can deduct one or the other, but it's predominantly the property tax, and most people, because the property tax is larger, do deduct that, agreed. And I've heard some people say, well, again, it's property tax is deductible. Yes, but 
then what are you saying? You'd rather have your property taxes go up when there's so much push and emphasis on reducing property taxes. In, in that your I, comparison, I'm not... Adam, on the last slide, yeah. I don't mean to inter you want me to no. wait till the end? Uh, yeah, let me just sure. finish up and then we'll Please, just I don't want to interrupt your yeah. flow. <laughs> no, but please don't forget your question. Oh, I won't. Um, <laughs> fiscal outlook and scenarios. And I think I can wrap this up in five minutes here. This is, this is a snapshot of our budget approach. Approach. We look at what we think might happen, wages, benefits, you know, health, health insurance, all, all the state revenue. We, we try to put that all in and project it out. And usually, you know, that can be tough just to do for a year. We've tried to do it 10 years out. So the farther you get out, certainly the less reliable these figures are. But we've tried to make them as conservative as we can, and we've built that into our formula. Next slide, please. What if we do nothing? What if we sit on our hands and just hope this all goes away? Well, we had a $3 million funding deficit in 2010. This year is done. This is our tax levy today, 44 million. We have a total of $140 million budget. 44 million is property tax levy. And we had a $3 million gap to contend with. What the board chose to do because of the economy, they certainly didn't want to raise property taxes. They weren't looking to reduce programs and services. They could have, but they didn't, at least not significantly. So they used fund balance. We have a healthy fund balance, rainy day fund, and they used a good, a good portion of it. But 1.7 million of that was associated with Sunny Ridge and we're getting out of the business there. And essentially the rationale was, it's raining, Let's help some people get through this year, use some of a rainy day fund. And because it was very healthy, they had that option and they implemented it. All right, so if we go forward with the projections that I just mentioned, what kind of fund balance, what kind of deficit are we looking at for 2011? It's going to be in the $3 million range. But that's based on a, a wage and benefit increase, wages at 3% in this scenario. And actually, we're not gonna be looking for 3% increases. We're gonna be looking to, to hold the line or 2% increases. Certainly, we, we need to do better and need help from our employees on that. But I'd say it's gonna be right around 3 million. And there out, it gets worse. So obviously, we can see ahead of us, we got a problem. <clears throat> and we need to do something to address it. Next slide, please. Well, what if we just raise property taxes to the max? People want to deduct those property taxes, Jim, well, we'll give them an opportunity. <laughs> so we could raise property taxes 15% right. next year. And the reason we could raise them that much, though there are state caps in place, because we've been frugal the last three years, we could take all that room and raise property taxes 15%. And I'm sure people would really appreciate that. Of course I'm being, I'm kidding. Uh, I can't imagine the county board raising property taxes 15%, but they could. They could do that, that would, that's their prerogative. And if they did that, we'd actually have a positive variance in 011. We'd go back to a 3%, that's what the rest of these do, is go back to a 3% thereafter. We'd be okay for 2012, and then we start getting into trouble again. So it would be, in my opinion, a short-term fix, and obviously, I just don't see anybody wanting to absorb that kind of increase. Next slide, please. Fund balance, some people have said, well, you have this healthy fund balance, use it. Well, we did in 2010. We could do so again. The county board self-imposed is to keep 5 to 10% of our general funds as a healthy fund balance. We have about 10 million now at about 9%. If we utilized our fund balance to address these deficits the next two years, we'd be okay at no 11, but then by 012, we'd be below our 5 to 10% threshold. Our bond rating would go down and people could start referring to the Sheboygan County as the state of Wisconsin because we'd be in the tank. Obviously, we don't want to utilize fund balance to, and fund balance won't resolve the problem. Could the board use a little fund balance and raise property taxes next year? Sure, they could do a little of that, but ultimately, fund, relying on fund balance is just gonna get you in a world of hurt. It shouldn't be used, as you know, as the norm. Next slide, please. So we talked about the sales tax revenue, what that could generate. This is what Lacrosse is receiving. Uh, 2008, about 9.8 million. Marathon, 10.7. Washington, 9.4. We looked at their average increases, de decreases. It's gone up about 2% each year over a five-year period. That's gonna go up and down depending on the economy. Next slide, please. 
and built that into our scenario and let me just cut to the chase. So what's the scenario? If the county board implements a half percent sales tax and they're gonna be voting on this March 16th, the thought is, the proposal is, is that a minimum of $200,000 would go toward economic development, job growth opportunities, revolving loan funds, something like that. The city has a more substantial revolving loan fund than the county, but through the new county economic development corporation that we're all a part of, we'd like to build some resources up there to help get businesses going. At one point, this was a million dollars, but the finance committee reduced it to a $200,000 minimum. Doesn't mean it can't be more, but no less than. A million dollars would go to the highway department. The highway department's been using retained earnings for seven years. They've, they know, they've known for seven years it was gonna run out. We have one more, and either they need to make some significant program reductions, which they may choose to do, or they need to fill that void. And there's more on that that I'll talk about in a second. Fund remaining deficit, if we did nothing and filled all the other gaps, it would be about $2.7 million, again, existing programs and services, that would be if we do nothing. In my opinion, that's not acceptable. We're gonna certainly continue to streamline and consolidate. And then a key part of this that I personally like is replacing our borrowing with the sales tax. Rather than borrowing four million a year, <coughs> using the sales tax. And if we did that, we could save your constituents and all constituents countywide over $5 million in interest alone. Now, some folks have suggested, well, you're not gonna be debt free in 2020, which is the proposal, that's not gonna happen. And I say to that, try me, put the challenge out there. Shouldn't we all be striving to have less debt? Shouldn't every unit of government be striving to have less debt? Why would you want your constituents paying interest if they don't have to. Will we be debt free in perpetuity? Probably not. You know, if we have to build a $25 million addition to our correctional facility or something like that, we're gonna have to bond. But if we can plan thoughtfully ahead and utilize sales tax revenue instead of bonding, we could be debt free in 10 years by 2020. And that is a challenge that I would love the county board to put out in front of us as a, as a organization. Next slide. If they don't implement the half percent sales tax, and I've said this to the county board every month, the last three months, if you don't wanna do this, that's your prerogative. This is not my decision, it's yours. But if not, tell me what you're gonna cut. Tell me what programs and services you're gonna cut. And I've gone to every liaison committee and had discussions with every board member and shared with them what kind of reductions they would have to make to fill this void. And if every, every county was gonna be part of the solution, if they were all treated somewhat equally and they were all gonna to have to take a percentage of the, the levy that they use now and reduce their expenses so much to fill that deficit, if they were all gonna, we're gonna cut our way out of this. The Sheriff's Department would be looking at about a $1.2 million reduction. Bless you. The High Health and Human Services Department would be looking at about a $1.2 million reduction. Uh, the Highway Department, about $327,000 in addition to the retained earnings uh, void that they're gonna fill. They're significant, they're significant. Next slide, please. I'll leave you with one example that I often ask board members and people in the community who, boy, I don't wanna see this half percent sales tax. And you know we need to make some cuts and we need to streamline and, and I agree with them. I don't wanna see it either. And yes, we need to cut and streamline. But what about our infrastructure in this county? Our highway department maintains 450 miles of roads. I don't know how many the city has. I'm certain you have a- Somebody knows that. 190? Okay, well, the county highway department is 450, and we have a lot more county roads than many counties around us, which puts us at a disadvantage from a financial standpoint. There's just more to care for. Sometimes we're compared with other counties, and they don't have half the roads we have to maintain. But if you have 450 miles of county road, the average lifespan of the surface is 15 years. So that means we need to be doing about 30 miles per year to maintain our infrastructure. 
Today, because of the belt tightening and the reductions and fuel t being twice as much as it was a few years ago, fuel oil, because of the cut, um, things we've had to absorb, we're doing somewhere between 10 and 14 miles. We're doing half of what we should be. Now, you can get, wa get away with that for a little while, and we have been. But ultimately, I ask you, what would you rather do? Pay $100,000 a mile to do one mile of overlay, pay $200,000 a mile to pulverize and repave because it hasn't been adequately maintained, or pay a million dollars a mile because the entire road needs to be rebuilt because the foundation has deteriorated so much. What's more fiscally responsible? I've yet to hear anyone suggest we shouldn't be paying $100,000 a mile to maintain. But I also am not hearing a lot of enthusiasm for diversifying our revenue streams or significantly cutting programs and services. Next slide, please. So we're in this position today in large part because the state has not been fiscally responsible. They've passed the buck to us. We've dealt with it for years. We'll continue to deal with it. But I'll tell you what, I'm not running for office. I'm not as concerned about being politically popular. What I think is we need to do what the state hasn't shown the courage to do. We need to diversify our revenue streams and we need to cut reduce, eliminate lesser priority programs to help fund higher priority programs. I think the responsible thing is to do both. But as you know, neither is popular, and the county board right now is struggling with this. And um, as it stands right now, the finance committee voted 3-2 to recommend it to the county board. It then went to our executive committee. Our executive committee recommended 4-1 to file it and then it'll go back to the full board March 16th. And I'm certain there'll be an interesting debate. And my sense is that it may not go. It may not go. And if it doesn't, I'll sleep all right for a while, as long as the county board is giving guidance on what programs and services are going to be cut and reduced. But if that doesn't come, um, then what, what will keep me up at night will be the thought of Sheboygan County starting to follow the path of the state of Wisconsin and the nation and what frankly I think has so many people angry. Uh, I do not want Sheboygan County to operate like that. All right, thank you. Please. Um, well, thank you. Uh, Adam, you talked about a self-imposed borrowing cap of about four million a year. Um, we have a self-imposed borrowing cap also. Uh, since 2006, our total debt was $72 million in 2006. And we've dropped our total debt, and that includes unfunded pension liability. We've dropped our total debt to $63 million. What has your debt done during the past four or five years? Everyone hear the question? Yeah. The, the, que the question is, uh, Alderman Bowers, uh, four years ago, the city of Sheboygan had $72 million of debt outstanding. And that included $12.3 million of unfunded pension liability. We've dropped that debt over those four years down to $63 million. Okay, so we've had, a, we've had a decline of almost $9 million in debt reduction. And we have a self-imposed borrowing cap. And my, my question is, and it's... One of the best things you can do uh, in reduction of debt is you reduce a recurring expense on that. Can you paint the picture for us and for the listening audience? What has the, has the debt of the county declined, increased, stayed the same over the last four years? Where, where are you? Good question. Uh, since the similar action you took, the self-imposed right. limitation the county board took in 2003, that positioned us for now our debt service is actually going down every year. So every year we are spending less on our debt service. Right now we spend 
Uh, memory serves about $6 million, $6.4 million in total on our overall <clears throat> debt, and our debt is right around 40, 45 million, right in that range. But every year it is now, it was going up prior to that, now every year it's going down. Can I have a, I ask a follow-up question? Uh, is, a, is any percentage of the proposed sales tax money uh, going to be going to directly reducing property taxes? That's everybody hear the question? Could you? And it, I asked, is any percentage of the proposed sales tax going to go to a direct reduction of property taxes? Well, that's all the time we have for. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, it, it depends on perspective, really. Uh, by state law, the half percent sales tax was put in place in 1986 uh, by the state legislature so counties could reduce property taxes, take the pressure of property taxpayers. And the Taxpayers Alliance and other folks have studied this since then. And some folks have the perspective that for every dollar you increase in the sales tax, you should have a dollar reduction in the property tax. That would we be. We don't have any more time. That, yeah, yeah, that was. <laughs> that would be one way of looking at it. And I wish, I really wish, we could implement a half percent sales tax, eight point nine million dollars, and reduce the property taxes, eight point nine million dollars. I wish it could be a one for one, but the reality is, and this is the same reality in the sixty three other counties that have implemented this, is. The other way of describing property tax relief is taking pressure off the property taxpayer. So if you raise the half percent sales tax and have this other revenue stream coming in, you aren't necessarily raising the property tax. In fact, hopefully, you're maintaining it for a number of years or reducing it somewhat for a few years. But ultimately, when you have the needs that I mentioned with, with infrastructure and maintaining programs and services, a good portion of that sales tax will be to maintain those programs and services. Now, if the county board came along and said, we are going to reduce $8.9 million of programs and services, we're going to reduce the sheriff's department by over a million in health and human services. We're not going to do our road overlay. We're going to return them all to gravel roads. You know, if they made those kind of decisions, then I think you could have a one-for-one. One. But uh, the reality is a good portion of that revenue is needed to maintain the programs and services we have. And the other reality is if we have that, that revenue stream, it does take pressure off the property taxpayer. They are not shouldering all the burden alone. Can I ask one more before Alderman Gisha gets to the mic? Wow. Just one more quick one. Uh, Textbook-wise, uh, sales taxes are perceived as regressive. It's a greater burden on those in our county with lower incomes. Uh, how have you been able to address that? That's a great question, and the regressive argument comes up from time to time. But studies have also shown now that the property tax, tax can also be considered a regressive tax. And that's because many people in our community are elderly. Many of your constituents are elderly. And depending on their income, the property tax can be a tremendously regressive tax for them. They, don't have, they have little to no control over it. They have to go in around the holidays and pay what can be a whopping bill. And that can create situations where people may have to leave their home. In fact, I read um, a statistic at the um, United Way Board of Directors meeting the other day where we've had, I think, 500 foreclosures in the last year. Now, if we had a sales tax, all the burden wouldn't have been on those people paying their property tax. They wouldn't have had as much burden on their shoulders. Does that mean those 500 people wouldn't have lost their home? No, probably not. But the regressive argument, I think, over time now has begun to weaken because uh, increasingly the property tax is becoming a real problem for people, particularly elderly people. Another example that came up actually from uh, a department head, a question was asked by that, and she said, my neighbor is struggling right now. She has four children and uh, her husband. They're both out of work. The church is helping them, and they've changed their buying decisions tremendously. You know, they're buying food, medication, the basics. 
things that are exempt from the sales tax by and large. The one thing they can't change is their property tax bill. And she said it's the property tax bill that may knock them out of their home. So I hope that answers it. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we have two uh, more lights on. Uh, Alderman Horne is first. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I've got several things for you, Adam. Uh, first of all, are your employees being educated to the fact that the sales tax money is not going to be a pot of gold for future wage and benefit increases? Are they being educated on that? Well, I, yeah. I, I guess, I, guess I, I worry that with all this additional sales tax money coming in where you're going to be able to slot this in various areas, right. I'm worried that your, your employees are going to think that this is a, pot, this is a, a big pot of gold where right. we're going to be able to shoot for the sky in wage and benefit increases, and I hope that's not going to be the case. And if I could just follow up before you answer, sure. uh, I understand that your sheriff's uh, department went to arbitration, right. and they won an arbitration. Did, did your bargaining team uh, make the suggestion to the sheriff's department before they went to arbitration that hypothetically, if, there, if, those, if that arbitration award was going to amount to, let's say, hypothetically, $400,000 in salary increases, that you were, you were considering laying off $400,000 worth of people if they got that arbitration award? Uh, I was, you know, I'm, I'm just a little bit disappointed in... in uh, in your your negotiations okay excellent excellent questions because that comments come up a lot the last few months um, the reality is is right now when we negotiate when the human resources committee and our HR director Mike Collard when they negotiate with eight our eight bargaining units as it stands right now they feel we have a pot of gold up our sleeve because we haven't implemented the half percent sales tax so you can argue it either way, but what we're hearing right now is don't tell me you're out of money. Don't tell me that you don't have any financial resources. You haven't even implemented the half percent sales tax that the state authorized back in 1986, and 63 of 72 counties are already implementing. So our employees have actually used that as an argument to strengthen their position that we're, we're not hurting, we're not in bad economic or fiscal shape as, as a county. Uh, so they've used that against us. So those board members or pe people in the public who have suggested, well, if you implement this now, all of a sudden you're rolling out a pot of gold form, I say quite the contrary. I think if we implement it and we have specific earmarked uses, as I went through with eliminating our borrowing and plugging the hole at the highway department and, and maintaining key programs and services, they aren't going to be able to point to that anymore as a pot of gold. But the key fundamental problem with county government and, and uh, negotiating with our bargaining units, and 89% of our employees are in a bargaining unit, and I want to say we have excellent, excellent employees, excellent employees who work very, very hard. When they negotiate with us, it's done in good faith, and you hope you come together on reasonable terms, and, then the, and if so, then the county board uh, ultimately approves that. If we don't come together, it goes to a state binding arbitrator. Understand. State rules dictate that if we don't come to terms, it goes to a state arbitrator. And what the state arbitrator does is they look at the two offers and say Sheboygan County's offer was, well, we're going to pay, we'll give you a 1% increase. Or maybe we'll be even more aggressive and say, we're going to hold the line, no increase. Or as some people have suggested, we're going to reduce your salary 10% whatever it may be, we come in with our offer and the bargaining unit comes in and says, well, we want two and a half or we want three or we want four in the case of the sheriff's department. What the binding arbitrator does then is they look at all the comparable municipalities or not all of them, but many of them. They'll look at comparable municipalities. The binding arbitrator can't compromise, can't say, well, this is too high and this is too low. They have to pick one or the other. They will select the one that they deem mo best reflects what other municipalities of a similar size have done. And more often than not, they're receiving two, two and a half, three percent increases. So until that's changed at the state level, it's the reality that we're dealing with. And though I wholeheartedly agree we need reform in that area, 
And when the Republicans actually had uh, leadership, the majority, Dan Lemieux, who was a former county board chairman, we, he put in sponsored legislation. I went to Madison. We talked about the changes that needed to be made so they would focus more on the economy and other things. Um, didn't go anywhere. The de Democrats nor the Republicans supported it. So we have a situation right now where it is difficult to really come firm on that. The, the, the follow-up on your final point, well, did we threat to reduce staff? That is a threat that the county board, that that human resources committee can make. But if you're going to threaten a, a bargaining unit, you better be able to back it up. And if you're going to threaten to reduce staff at the sheriff's department, hmm. I don't know if that would play real well in this community, depending on the number of employees you're, you're suggesting be reduced. Imagine if we did that at Rocky Knoll and said, well, if you don't settle on this, we're going to reduce so many nurses and CNAs work out at Rocky Knoll. We couldn't morally do that. They have to take care of the residents. So it's a, it's a challenging situation that I'm sure uh, Alderman Sirk is well aware of based on his previous experience here. If I could follow up, Madam Chair, <clears throat> there was, a, I thought, a thoughtful editorial uh, in the uh, guest editorial in the Sheboygan Press yesterday having to do with the staffing levels of your highway department compared to some of the other highway departments in the surrounding counties. And the, the gentleman made the point that the surrounding counties are doing maintenance old only rather than construction. Has, uh, has the county board taken a look at that of possibly Sheboygan County only doing the maintenance and farming out the construction, and would it be cost effective? And again, Manitowoc counties and the other counties have about half of the employees in their highway department compared to ours over 100. Right, yeah, and, and I certainly welcome when we see letters or suggestions like that, although uh, sometimes I think they, they, they draw people to conclude that, well, if Manitowoc can do it, why can't we? There's a lot of differences between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. One is just the number of roads we have to care for, a lot of variables. But your point is excellent uh, in the fact that Sheboygan County's highway department does do more than most county highway departments. We're in the construction. And I've, since I started here, I thought, boy, that's unusual. If most counties are doing predominantly maintenance, why are we also in the construction? And I quickly learned from the county board supervisors who were very involved with the transportation committee and, and on town boards, there's a real strong relationship here between the county and the towns, municipal work, working hand in hand, and that can all benefit the taxpayer. But the key thing for me that drilled down into it was we had an operational analysis done. We had virtual Krauss come in and we didn't point the consultant in any one way or the other. We said, take a look at this and let us know what you think. And what that consultant concluded was right now, based on the infrastructure that the county board has invested in, we're geared up and we can provide a cost-effective service. However, the consultant recommended that in the next three to five years, when that infrastructure begins to deteriorate or needs to be replaced, that's really the time the county board needs to seriously consider whether or not it wants to be providing this level of service. What our highway commissioner would probably tell you if he was standing here, Greg Schnell, and he's excellent, he would say, you know, I envision we're probably going to be reducing over time. I just think that's the nature of government at all levels. But his concern is uh, if you only have one private uh, person in the area bidding and the county is no longer in the game, that could really raise prices for the towns and all the municipalities and the city and everyone else who needs that gravel or needs that work. And then our folks could be paying more in that area. So time will tell. But yes, we've looked at it. Yes, we've studied it. And yes, I think that over time changes are going to be made. If I could have just one more, Madam Chair, and that is the, the items that you're intending the sales tax to be used on, Adam, is that going to be in a formal document that that you know, the ones that you pointed out where you're going to use it, is that going to be in a formal document? And then what will be the mechanism from the county board not coming up in another year with wanting to pigeonhole something else? I mean, is there going to have to be uh, a two-thirds vote to change the prioritization of those funds, or how is that going to work as time goes along? Yeah, again, excellent questions. The county board 
has to pass an ordinance, and that ordinance has been drafted, that, that went to the Finance Committee, that went to the Executive Committee. Is that online, Kay, on our website? So if you go to the county website, these, these are here I mentioned, the, the ordinance is there, the sales tax presentation and background information is there, and, and that's what they'll be specifically acting on. We've done our best to try to earmark the use of those funds, and we also built in language that it could only be used for existing programs and services, because some people have suggested, well, you're going to create all, this, all these new programs, and, and uh, I just, I certainly don't see that happening, but we, we built that in. It has to be for existing programs and services for these particular areas. Could the county board come back in a year or two and change it? Yes. Does it require a two-thirds majority vote? No, simple majority. And there have been some board members who have suggested, well, there's no way I'm going to support this because, you know, we'll probably turn around in a year or two and start doing frivolous things with it. And when I hear that, again, it makes me grin because it is the county board that is the governing body that will make the decision on whether or not to implement a sales tax. It's their decision. And if they agree to do so, on these guidelines, I would hope they would see it through, that they could look in the mirror and say, we're going to see this through and use it responsibly. The other thing in our favor is, well, in our favor from a standpoint of that argument, is the county board doesn't see much turnover. There's very little turnover, sadly, very little competition for board member seats. So if you have a new port person or two every two years, how much is that going to start swinging things? And then finally, I look at the track record, and I'll always come back to the track record. The county board in 2003 put a self-imposed bonding limitation of $4 million a year, $8 million over two years. They've followed it to the T since 2003. They've saved taxpayers over $500 million in interest. Can they see it through? I absolutely think they can see it through. Thank you. We have one question card. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, of the, Mr. Payne, of the 63 counties that have adapted this uh, half percent sales tax, uh, how many of them have followed the protocol that you have set forth here or maybe their own protocol and have seen an increase in their uh, savings. Uh, in other words, has it worked out for most of these counties when they implemented the sales tax? Or did they go on a spending spree? It, uh, it, it depends. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know for certain. I think county boards um, generally are a conservative animal. You mm -hmm. know, I, I think they're pre predominantly conservative minded folks. So I don't think there's been wild spending sprees. I think it's the, the very opposite. I think county boards across the state, just like city councils across the state, are trying to stay fiscally responsible with the kind of demands that are getting placed on us by the state. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's spending sprees out there. How the dollars have been used goes back to Alderman Hanna's question about the one for one or providing relief, taking pressure off. And that, depending on the county, can be more or less. But uh, I'm not aware of any counties out there that are on spending sprees. I, in fact, at this time in government, if you look at the projections, I think for the next two, three, four decades, we're going to be in a, in a transition period with government where we're just going to continue to be slimming down and getting as efficient and as lean as we can. I think we're going to have to. Okay. Alderman Gisha. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Adam, you know, I know this is a countywide plan and your numbers are all countywide. Our concern in this room, of course, is the people living in the uh, borders around the inside the borders of the city of Sheboygan. And because we are a major center for retail and for uh, population, uh, I'm curious as to how many dollars this extracts from the gross consumer spendable income of our citizens here. I understand the countywide problem. But it's the pocketbooks of the citizens, I think, is our concern. And uh, so what is Sheboygan's, uh, what are you taking out of the citizens of Sheboygan as part of this $8 million plus? That would go, and good question. That goes back to that slide of, and again, simple math, but if we take the total population, uh, it averages about $62 per person. So you could say $62 per capita per person in the city of Sheboygan uh, would be, would each person would be contributing on average $62 in sales tax revenue annually. So but that, again, 
really depends on how much income is coming into that household. So I've had some people say to me, well, if you have five people in your family, then you're, you're spending 62 yeah. times five. No, you're not. Not if that family is bringing in $40,000 of income right. each year. Right. The, um, I do agree with, with Alderman Bourne on, on the point of uh, your payroll has raised over the last 10 years about five or six million bucks. Yet your head counts down. You're paying less people more money. And that's not just, you're, we're not immune to that. Is, uh, is that the projected version or the, the current? Uh, budgeted uh, property tax levy comparison year over year. Okay. Uh, that would be 98 through 2010. I just actually, right now, our payroll is less today than it was in 2002. Uh, yeah, but then it, you have a nice little bump up there and then a drop down oh. with the Sunny Ridge. So, the on sun, average. Right. Uh, which is fine. I mean, I'm not saying you, no. you're not do, having the same problems everybody else is having, but uh, it does illustrate the point that you're not hearing, I don't assume, bargaining units clamoring uh, for you not to raise this tax. Uh, I don't see uh, AFSME standing on the corner uh, taking out billboards saying, don't raise this tax. And I think that the point from Alderman Bourne is well taken. Since the state budget changed the mediation arbitration rules last year, this actually is like a hand in glove. Uh, they now can look at these revenue streams and just as you say, mm -hmm. saying, uh, now you don't have any problems because look at the cash. I don't care what you designated it. Basically, under mediation arbitration, they can say your well thought out and I think incredibly sincere plan uh, can go away and you have to move it into that area. So I don't imagine, first of all, I guess, where's the question in there? Uh, are you, uh, what is the input you're getting from bargaining units? Very little yeah, input from bargaining. So. Um, we've done, what, nine forums so far. I was in the town of Sherman last week in the village of Oostburg and been to Noon Rotary and Rotary West and number of public forums. Taxpayers Alliance is next week. Uh, this Friday, it'll be the Friday forum. And generally, it's been audiences like this. I mean, we've usually averaged 40 to 50 people. So the turnouts were not what I thought they would be. You know, tonight, I thought we'd see a lot more people uh, sitting in wanting to learn more about this. Um, well, when, we, when we decided we were going to, uh, the discussion was around a garbage fee. Uh, you had 60 people here say it's not deductible, so I don't want to do it. Yeah. Here you have a $62 fee. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it just, it's just perception and the, the timing and, yeah. and what's a hot button. But um, y you understand, we've talked about this, the timing on this is kind of stinks uh, the, for ti you. the timing stinks. Yeah, the timing, I, timing stinks, but yeah. tell me when it's ever a good time to raise taxes. One of the things that I, I'd like to share is that there's some discussion right now. Some I type can of answer that question, by the way. Well, I'm not asking you all oh, that. Oh, sorry, I have a question. <laughs> uh, I have the answer for you, Adam, uh, if you'd no, like. <laughs> if I worked here, of course, I'd never respond that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, would you like to respond? I'm well, sorry. I, I, and it kind of goes back to some of your comments, I thought. Uh, I think the answer is I, uh, I, I believe, and I, I consider you a friend, first of all, and, 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 and I have a lot of respect for what you've done at the county, and I think you're outrageously sincere on your scenarios of where those monies are going to go, uh, I don't believe for a minute it'll play out. Uh, it's just the reality of the exact comments you're saying. Um, here's our sketch and here's our budget plan, uh, but gee, the sheriff's department needs five more people or whatever. They, the political realities enter into this and enter into your job and, and you have to sort through those things. Um, there is no lockbox. There is no guarantee of your plan being followed by crazy politicians like us. Uh, it, it is the whim of the times. And, and I don't, uh, I'm not specifically commenting on, on the county, but you have very long-term supervisors who have very strong ties to the areas and committees they're on. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine you have some pretty strong fights over turf and every one of them will want something. That's just human nature. And based on the plan I see, every one of them will have a pot to get it. And that'll delay. I love your plans. I've read all your things online. Uh, I don't have a life, so I, I read those things, Adam. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and it's phenomenal. I think it's excellent work. And, and I've stolen many of things from it. So. And, and I've taken good ideas from you and your, your counsel as well. Uh, but, uh, but as you say, they won't even follow the lead of what is excellent data now. Uh, I don't imagine they'll do it. 
I, I don't think the county board, as I mentioned earlier, you know, not to make pre predictions, but I, I don't think it's going to um, be supported March 16th. That, that won't surprise me. And if that doesn't happen, the sky will not fall. We will be okay. But as you can see, the numbers aren't, I mean, they're not just pull, pulled out of a hat. It's real. We'll be okay for a while. And in my opinion, it's not a matter of if, but when. And if they choose not to do it now, then what I'll be striving for is then, all right, tell me what you significantly want to reduce, cut, eliminate. And in my opinion, I don't think the county board is going to significantly reduce programs and services. I think we will continue incrementally to make reductions, to streamline, to gain efficiencies, everything government should be doing. But I think in Sheboygan County, we've got a lot of good things in place. And I just don't envision this county board significantly reducing the sheriff's department, health and human services. Rocky Knoll, maybe that'll come up and folks will suggest it be privatized, but we went from three facilities to one, and I think we'd have these rooms packed if they were talking about privatizing our last county owned and operated nursing home. We've also dropped our tax levy from 6.2 million to 1.9. We've made progress. But I'll tell you what, Either we, we need to get serious in this county and in this state and in this nation about being Let's fiscally see. responsible or not. And again, it's, it's not politically pop popular to do yeah. either of these things, but if we're not going to just pass the buck to our kids and grandkids, uh, we got to take some action. And so you're probably right. Not everything up here will necessarily go to plan as planned. Few things do. Yeah. But we'll, I would relish the opportunity for Sheboygan County to lead by example, to try to be debt free by 2020, and not pass on as much debt to our children and grandchildren. I would relish that opportunity. And, and I hope the board, if it isn't March 16th, sometime in the future, uh, grabs hold of this and, and proclaims if we're going to be fiscally responsible, we're going to have to address both sides of the equation. Final comment, Madam Chair, if that's okay. I have okay. question to someone else wants. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll be real brief. Uh, I, I loved your last statement. Uh, and uh, however, I think the county has been leading by example. Yeah. Uh, we'd I, like I, to continue. Uh, well, I, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but turning to a half a percent sales tax is not leading by example. It's becoming like the rest of the state. Okay. And, uh, uh, and I know that's the balance. And I, I believe people would be more interested in this if, in fact, it was, and I know it's hard to do with government, 100% uh, dedicated for the first five years for debt reduction or something to that effect. But I think it's just too, too much money in the bucket and a lot of hands wanting to get in there and get it. And I, so I said before, I think you have a lot of people who are licking their chops hoping this passes for you. And, and on that note, and I was going to comment on that earlier and I forgot because Jim raised it and you raised it. Alderman Bourne, I'm sorry. Um, we're listening to people. County Board Supervisors are certainly listening. And on the wage and benefits, you know, the golden pot here, uh, very recently, within the last week, one of our board members who has the ability to bring people together and hopefully forge a compromise suggested that we push the date back further. Because, you know, I said earlier, no time's a good time. Well, I think it would have been worse a year or two ago when the economy was really going down. Now, hopefully, we've hit bottom and we're coming up. But one board member has suggested perhaps we delay the implementation date to January 2012, and we also require that none of the sales tax revenue can be used for wage or benefits, for county employee wage and benefits. If you can do that legally. You bet we can, just like we can earmark it for debt service or infrastructure, what have you. So that may be something that the community and the county board can rally behind because it addresses some of the concerns that, oh, this is going to be a pot of gold for folks. We'll see. Cool. Okay. I would just like to say um, we're coming, uh, we are past our limit. I have two people's lights on, and I think that'll be it. Okay, for everyone else? Okay, so uh, Alderman Rindfleisch. Thank you. Um, Madam Chairman, um, a couple of points. Uh, that I've had conversations with people uh, talking about this, and I'm sure you've heard the same thing. Certainly, it's per the perception is as a new tax. It's an increase in taxes, the net taxes. And again, if it's dollar for dollar, you know, decrease in property versus increase in property, I think actually misses the bigger point here. Uh, the bigger point is the government needs revenues to operate. And, and 
the, the amount of revenue is operated, that's up for debate, and we're trying to streamline our own selves here and, and operate on less uh, and provide quality level services as the county government is as well too. Um, but as that, that number decreases, um, it's, more, it's most important for government to look at all revenue streams and balance revenue streams. And Adam did hit on this a little bit too, is that right now, property tax is the revenue stream, period. Uh, and that anything comes up, any rainy day issues come up, any disasters hit, there is one stream only, and that is property taxes. Um, oh, and the flip side of that is decreased in services as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas a blended revenue stream allows some flexibility. Uh, it's not necessarily an increase in tax. You can, you know, we're paying it one way or the other, uh, but even if the, the, the blended stream allows for at least 20% or whatever number that is of auto, people that are paying those taxes that aren't from here. Mm -hmm. And um, property tax can't do that. Um, it, it doesn't have the same thing. Even if they own property here, you know, they're, they're paying their portion of that one. Uh, in terms of um, regressive tax on um, sales tax, uh, the textbooks do say that uh, as long as the necessities are counted. And that's because you know, someone who earns 400000 doesn't buy unless you work at costs, uh, four times the amount of clothing or buy four times the number of shoes or four times the amount of food to survive. Um, and when you eliminate that, now you're looking at um, um, the, the, the expenditures that are optional. And then it's not a regressive tax. It's actually a progressive tax. We look at those that are buying boats and yachts and cars and, and, and things like that that aren't the, the poorest members of our society. Um, so again, I'm not arguing for it. I'm just throwing something out there that, that kind of consider uh, other ways that, that government needs to look at that. Um, you know, we're doing the same thing with the garbage fee that we looked at, that, that got shot down, uh, stormwater fees that we've had in the past, wheel tax in the past, looking at ways of, of bringing additional revenues in. Unfortunately, I think in the past it was simply a way to plug the budget hole. It wasn't used as just a, uh, you know, a full pot of money that we have, and now we can you know, and, and just keep it at that pot of money, regardless of how that money comes in, just make it a fair share, but keep the total expenditures down. I think that's the key, is what the government's looking at, expenditures not to go up, as you pointed out. Uh, but as for the, uh, t uh, um, the negotiations, uh, I'm going to have to agree with Adam on this one in the sense that as long as there's a possibility of bringing revenue in, the unions have the county over the barrel. Uh, to say that there is more revenue, we don't have to go hold the line at a 0% tax. Whereas the city right now, we've had something similar in terms of do we bring in three additional firefighters? If we do, which jobs, where is that coming from? Who are we not hiring? What other programs would be short money that we are capped off uh, if we unless uh, property tax, whereas that this will allow them to say, we're capped off. You know, if you want us to raise uh, in salary benefits, then you need to tell us where it comes from, which other department it comes from, versus there's this, this mystical amount of money that, that they're not collecting they could collect. So again, it's, it's all perception, it's all ways of, I'm not necessarily supporting of it, I'm just saying that there are other ways of looking at it, um, not just as a new tax, but as a total pot of revenue generated to fill the bills, fit the, to pay the bills, uh, and uh, it's not as, as regressive as, as textbooks would generally like to say it, and that um, I think right now is what the Sheriff's Department shows it, that they're, they're saying you can raise the taxes right now. You know, go ahead, raise them to, to the limit. And there's no pain involved if you raise it. Whereas I think if this went through, now they would, they would be on, have to sit on the same side of the table saying, well, where's it going to come from? Just some points I want to bring up. No question. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, You're good for you, Adam. <laughs> the last uh, person I think will have to speak is Alder Person Cop. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Mr. Payne, in the event that this passes and you've got this big pot of gold and uh, you've got money in the reserve, at what point will you take over the library, our parks, <laughs> uh, to give basically the city, I mean our city taxpayers some relief? At what point will we take over the library? That yes. was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't envision that happening anytime soon. Oh. So that's not earmarked? That's not? No, no. I, occasionally that, you know, constituents will raise that or we've had some general discussion about that. But the county is really in no position to be adding on additional responsibilities or additional programs and services. We, we're just in no position to do it. We're trying to, we're trying to maintain what we have. I think we'll uh, thank you very much, Adam Payne. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, County Administrator Payne <laughs> and Kay, is it Kay? Kay Lorenz for coming in to assist him. And um, is there anything else to bring up? We have a.
there's a motion to adjourn. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night.